Hello Cecil County and the world. This is Cecil TV, 30 at 6, and it's June the 18th. I'm Rob Churnside. Allison Donnelly is not here tonight, but she'll be back next week with exciting details of our top secret project. We do have with us tonight, though, Susan, black-eyed Susan, the Maryland state flower. And speaking of Maryland, U.S. of A., and the world, we may have a for foreign correspondent. More details on that coming up. This weekend at Dove Valley Winery, the baseball club of Rising Sun is hosting a five-team baseball tournament, both Saturday and Sunday. You can come out and bring a picnic blanket and a picnic lunch. You can uh, find a shady spot to watch the game. Old time baseball as it was played back in 1864. No gloves, tough, tough game. Dove Valley this weekend. And if you, uh, you can't bring outside alcohol, they serve it there. So check out Dove Valley's website, check out the Baseball Club of Rising Sun and have a good time in a good old fashioned baseball game Saturday or Sunday at Dove Valley. Now, politics. Early voting continues this week until Thursday, June 21st. Primary day is next Tuesday, June 26th. We want to remind all of our voters and their friends and families how important it is to exercise your right and responsibility to vote. In Cecil County, the overwhelming majority of candidates are from one party. So most of the local elections are decided in the primary. These local elections are so important because they affect you, your children, and your community directly. Not a Democrat or Republican? Don't skip election day. Independents or unaffiliated voters can still choose a judge and a school board member. The deadline to participate in the county's Community Center Needs Assessment Survey has been extended through June. This study aims to determine whether there is a need for a community center, and if so, where it should be built and what kinds of services it should offer to citizens. To provide input, input visit www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash county wide underscore survey. Susan, they want your opinion too. Thanks. I'm home! Wow, it's hot in here. Grandma says call the Moon Man. <laughs> moon Man, the AC is out and my family is melted! At your service! <laughs> there you go! Mission accomplished! Thanks, Moon Man! <sighs> the house is nice and cool again. Moon Man, you're awesome. You're welcome! Just go to moonairinc.com! <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Charles. For 30 years, I have been practicing functional medicine and gentle chiropractic. Elkton Chiropractic Neurology is dedicated to enhancing whole body rejuvenation. Whether or not you are afflicted with injury or disease, we utilize a structural, neurologic, metabolic, nutritional, and energetic approach to restoring your body to its full potential. After coming to Dr. Charles, I'm better than I was before. You deserve to feel good and to have an active lifestyle. So why not call Elkton Chiropractic Neurology today? Welcome, I'm Jacob Owens, Managing Editor of the Cecil Whig Newspaper. I'm here today with incumbent Councilman Dan Schneckenberger from District 3. Uh, welcome, Dan. You get a chance to sit down and uh, talk a little bit about the 2018 campaign with Thank us. Thank you, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. I just want to say, first and foremost, to anybody watching out there, that we did extend inv invitations uh, to both Al Miller as well as Thomas Wilson, uh, your opponents in the Republican primary to come and answer some questions with us today. Uh, they both either declined or did not respond to that invitation, wondering uh, mm -hmm. just any reaction in terms of their decision to not be here today. Um, I, I've tried to be as successful as I can throughout my, uh, my four-year term. Um, and honestly, when I was elected, uh, Cecil TV was not even, even part of it, but they've been a uh, regular fixture at our county council meetings and just felt it was a good opportunity when uh, Doug tried repeatedly to put this District 3 panel together, and I said, hey, I'm available at any time you want, and so I'm glad to be here. Um, we've done several forums, lots of opportunities, and I think uh, that's, a, a, as a candidate, you have to be accessible so voters can see what your position is on the issues. Sure. 
Now, Dan, you're serving currently as vice president of the <coughs> council, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the second senior position on the council. Uh, you're finishing up a first term here uh, mm -hmm. with the county's legislative body. You've now been through two budget cycles underneath uh, County Executive Alan McCarthy. Mm -hmm. First one marked by uh, a, a pretty controversial debate over some tax increases. Uh, right. The second one, not so much, although uh, it, there were some questions over some, some spending allocations. Sure. Just wondering, uh, if from a general impression, uh, where do you feel that the, the council and the county really stand after uh, two cycles here with, with County Executive McCarthy? Well, I think certainly the second budget was, was a, uh, certainly a lot one, one that people could agree with. Uh, we, we went through a very excessive tax increase. It was a surprise to all of us. And one of the things we indicated to the county executive was we don't want to be surprised anymore. That was a surprise budget, and uh, and said let's let's try to work together and be a little bit more. Whatever revenues were coming in, that's what mm -hmm. we're going to spend. We don't need any more revenue increasing budgets, or it's going to fail. It, it would fail again, or we, you know, have to look look at some other measures. I think the other part is can, our uh, county council hired for the first time our own auditor, mm -hmm. and I don't know that that kept. The county executives budget people honest or not, but um, I think I think uh, we're going to continue to do that in the future to look, to look for ways to allow county council to have a, a very good say in the budget process. Right, and for viewers out there that are unaware, the council <coughs> of course doesn't have an opportunity to add spending to the budget, mm -hmm. although there are some uh, limited means in, in the education budget. But for the most part, your goal is to either cut spending uh, and, and fulfill some revenue obligations. But I'm wondering, uh, the first budget you guys were a part of obviously mm -hmm. ended in some controversy because you guys were unable to uh, agree on a proposal amongst uh, yourselves, the five-member body, uh, that there were a number of cut discussions mm -hmm. uh, that, that came up last year for that. I'm wondering, just general reaction, how do you feel about, about how that cycle ended ultimately with uh, Executive McCarthy's uh, proposal becoming law without... Uh, Action from the well, I, I think a lot of people were surprised that that, that measure had, we, we amended our charter, you know, I, I believe the first year that uh, County Executive Moore was in to relay that back. A lot of mm -hmm. people thought if you rejected a budget, it went back to the previous fiscal year, which is very, almost impossible to do once you've, you know, indicated the kind of spending cycles you want to do. Um, Honestly, I, I still run on a platform of being a fiscal conservative. Uh, I did not want to raise taxes. We, we at least two council members tried very hard to put some significant cuts into that budget, and uh, we still need three people to agree. We did not. Uh, I was actually surprised that Councilman Patchell voted against the budget since he didn't uh, suggest any cuts in the entire budget cycle. I thought the budget would pass and we would have roughly a half million dollars of cuts and I s still would have voted against it but uh, that was a surprise vote and so uh, the rest is history. Yeah. This cycle of course we didn't get uh, any proposed tax increases from um, Executive McCarthy's budget although <coughs> there were some some spending allocations that certainly people had some questions about whether it was the Northeast Library mm -hmm. or some of the, uh, the park acquisitions and upgrades. Right. Um, and certainly yourself has, has been vocal about some of the fire company allocations Correct. as well. Uh, just wondering, did you, in the end, you did not propose any spending cuts uh, to the executive's proposal. I'm wondering uh, what, if there was a reason for that or if you just felt that uh, his proposal was sufficient. I felt, I felt the budget was, was very, very much better this year. I, I, I think the spending priorities were where they needed to be. Um, obviously, the Board of Education wanted some more funding, but we didn't have the revenue to do that. Um, <clears throat> the other two, when you talk about library or parks, they were both in our capital improvement program, so it really didn't affect our our budget as much, you know, the operating budget or, or um, the small cap budget. So those were ones we were going to get bonds anyway to, to invest sure. on. Uh, the turf field in Bohemia was a little surprising, but I think... Um, uh, the administration wanted to move it up one mm. year. They were talking about every two years about doing that. Um, and then, obviously, the the other one to to have such a sizable cut in the fire fire company's equipment budget um, had the budget had to be balanced. I understand that part. Mm. But when 
at least five or six days after the budget had been released and there was no word from the administration that they were going to try to make this up, that's when, and listening to the fire companies, I felt it was obligated to, you know, take their position and say, we need to fully fund this. We know we have close to a $1.8 million surplus in fiscal year 18, so I really felt that we will have some additional revenues that we can either look to restore that funding completely. It's about $580,000 and still have at least a million dollars left over for a potential tax cut or what have you. And we're already looking at a surplus in fiscal year 19. So 17, 18, 19, I mean, most people would realize that maybe, maybe our taxes are too high if, if we're going to run surplus mm -hmm. budgets. Sure. And uh, Executive McCarthy has obviously made it a uh, priority in his uh, in his budget proposals mm -hmm. to balance without the use of savings, and that's you know somewhat of a, a novel idea in the, in the county's recent history, right. and it's led to uh, probably some hand wringing over some particular mm -hmm. uh, allocations. It, just in general terms, thoughts on whether the county should perhaps spend a little bit more of its savings on some of these uh, one-time projects, or or if what he is doing in the long run is, is the right decision? I think I think in the long run it's a sound strategy. I think it was, again, a, a difference from what he potentially had believed on campaigning for that office. I never heard that that piece come, you know, from his lips. I, I understand the fiscal piece of it. Uh, everybody has an idea where that percentage of unassigned fund balance should be. And we probably could build it up, and maybe we'll do so as we continue to see the tax revenues from some of the new businesses that the county has created here in the last uh, year and a half. That's really going to bolster our, uh, our, our re reserves and revenues, mm -hmm. and there'll be a chance to put some of that money aside uh, with that. Although it is curious that the administration came with a budget amendment for $130,000 to fund two parks employees back in January to help facilitate not only uh, getting Calvert ready for the spring, but also the, the new park that's at the former Brantwood Golf Course. Mm -hmm. So they actually <laughs> then went against their own policy by saying, here, we're going to take savings to create mm -hmm. growth in the government. And I, I felt that was the wrong approach. It was inconsistent, and I voted against that. Sure. Um, kind of dovetailing off a little bit of what you were just talking about there, I'm interested in terms of the county's economic development mm -hmm. um, policy and future. Obviously, we've had a number of large gains here in just the, in the last few years, whether it's uh, Lidl mm -hmm. or Amazon, True Air, um, Fortress Steel, a number mm -hmm. of others. In terms of where we are in terms of economic growth um, and pursuing some of these uh, distribution-related industries, do you feel that that's the right uh, uh, sector to be pursuing, or is diversification of, of services something we should we should put an emphasis on? I think diversification is is always the goal. I mean, uh, we have a very large park, Principio Industrial Park. Uh, it was almost 800 and some acres of improved land that was zoned for distribution, and that's because of the tremendous growth yet from the Port of Baltimore. We're we're seeing that growth. There, are people want to say, "Hey, I need the land." and Cecil County's got it. Um, we're we're going to see more growth with Medline coming on stream maybe by the end of the year. Right. Um, the property tax base from just these, these companies is roughly, you know, close to $30 million after the enterprise zone tax credits expire over the next 10 years. But every year we're going to get a bigger check right. from these investments. And that, to me, is the proper way to balance your budget. Look at that tax base as opposed to looking at the people to pay the property taxes um, from that standpoint. But what people, Jake, fail to realize is W.O. Gore hired this year. Mm. Tarumo is looking to hire 900 people over the next five years, and they've already hired at least 100 last year. Uh, Orbital ATK, Northrop Grumman. Uh, there's a big push to have some expansion there with some very high-tech engineering-related jobs. Uh, so I think, I think the county is looking at all avenues, but those are things that are going to come on and are going to balance this, this, this wave of distribution uh, activities that, that we have. And we've also been told by these tenants that, you know, our workforce is still available. We're not, we haven't tapped it out, meaning there's not enough workers to, to, right. to fill with Medline or, you know, two other tenants that are going to potentially be announced later this year or, or what have you. So. I think Cecil County at this point has to continue to get these. 
because they are good revenue makers for the for the county and we really haven't seen any of the revenue from all the hires this is just basic permit fees transfer taxes and and what have you and it's it's helped us out and i think every year we're going to continue to see sure. uh, you know uh, you know the fruits of those labors income tax and everything else piggybacking off that in future years yes um, so, you, so you mentioned there that uh, some of the economic development growth that is happening in the county isn't necessarily, you know, grabbing headlines, whether it's Gore hiring or Tarumo hiring. No, uh, and so there, and there might be a diversification yeah. that, that isn't as noticeable. Already. Well, they're, they're, these are these are really high tech manufacturers. The manufacturing sector in Cecil County is, is one of the top uh, top sectors in the state. Uh, Department of Commerce and Secretary Gill understands that as well. So these companies continue to invest here, um, and you know they they W O Gore's got 14 sites, and they they continue to innovate and and look for ways to expand their product line, and and they're going to do it right here in Cecil County. Uh, we're thrilled about Terumo saying, hey, we're going to invest here in in Elkton and mm -hmm. uh, and continue to expand, and and Northrop Grumman I think is going to be a very good. Uh, uh, addition. It's going to actually give us the, a big time defense contractor. Uh, they did not have a rocket propulsion uh, um, division. They, they compete with Lockheed Martin all the time. Lockheed Martin does. Right. Orbital, Orbital ATK was going against Lockheed Martin and a lot of uh, defense contractors. Now Northrop Grumman can go after them with, uh, with all the phases and uh, I, I just think that bodes well for a educated stem related type uh, workforce that right now our schools do very well and in, in producing some of these kids we just have to once they get their college degree we can come back and say hey you have a job here come back to cecil county and you know uh, work and and uh, live and play sure <laughs> Warmer weather is here and people are going outdoors for recreation exercise and gardening this exposes people to the small creatures, mainly mosquitoes and ticks, that pose a risk of disease. To find out what these risks are and how we might protect ourselves, we paid a visit to the Cecil County Health Department to speak to Deputy Health Officer Dr. Henry Taylor. Well, any of these insects are an annoyance. Uh, sometimes we wonder why we're plagued with them, uh, but they fit in the overall ecological cycle and have their place. The ticks and mosquitoes are vectors for disease is the short answer. With mosquitoes, you really want to protect uh, yourself from mosquitoes by not allowing them to breed in the first place. So if you have a around your home, if there are marshy areas, um, kind of work, don't dig big trenches, but you want to kind of keep the water off of those wet areas. Uh, if you have old swimming pools, you know, those plastic play pools, make sure that you drain them, flip them upside down. Um, the, they sell in the store. It's not an insecticide, it's a larvicide. They look like little donuts and they contain a bacteria that is toxic to the mosquito larvae. So those can be put in a swimming pool and it will kill those little tiny squigglers. And, um, prevent the mosquitoes from coming in the first place. So draining any standing water, uh, keeping screens in good repair. If there are small cuts in the screen, you can get these little patches. Uh, make sure the screens are tight fitting and you can really protect yourself well against the mosquitoes. And while Zika poses a real threat in tropical areas, Dr. Taylor says the risks are not so great here. Fortunately, in the United States, we haven't had sustained transmission of Zika. Uh, there were pockets in Florida and Texas uh, last year, but pretty much with good mosquito control programs, uh, we don't think it's something that's going to get a foothold and be continued in the United States. On the other hand, the danger posed by ticks should be considered when heading outside. It's best if you're walking on a path that is open where you aren't brushing up against leaves and grasses. We find the ticks tend to be easier detected if, they're, uh, if you wear light clothing. So you'll see a lot of recommendations to wear light clothing, and that's mainly so that you can see them and get them off you quickly. DEET and other repellents are very effective and keep the mosquitoes and the ticks away from you. So spraying the uh, insect repellent around your ankles, um, treating the bottom part of your pant legs uh, is an important thing to 
keeps the ticks from crawling up. They like to crawl up and then wedge into small little spaces and mm -hmm. hang on. Most of the diseases that are transmitted by ticks require the tick to be on for 24 to 48 hours. And that's based on the fact that in studies where they were looking for Lyme disease vaccine, they didn't see any transmission in anybody who had a tick for less than 24 hours. So we're comfortable about that number. If you have been bit by a tick and you remove it safely, and there are lots of instructions about how to do that, I just take my pen, make a little mark where it was so I can remember, because most of the time nothing's going to happen. Um, if you then see a rash developing with everybody having cell phones, I recommend you just snap a picture because when I was in country practice, you know, I believe the patients who came in, but there's nothing like a picture. Uh, and if you see the bullseye rash, um, then that is actually diagnostic. You don't need to go through all the expensive blood tests take six weeks for the test to turn positive. If you get that bullseye rash or a rash that looks similar to it, the color, a um, friend of mine says it's like a red coral reef. It's a, it's a rosy red rash. It has a very sharp edge to it. it. That makes it a little different from some of the other rashes that people get. If you see that rash, get it checked out and a full three-week course of treatment can nip everything in the bud and make you feel better faster. Katie, I'm thrilled to begin our nursing studies together at Cecil College. I've enjoyed being in class together at the Cecil County School of Technology. Congratulations on your success at Rising Sun. Love, Gina. Gina, you are a young woman with a true calling. We are so proud of all your success and wish you the best with your nursing career. Love, Mom and Dad. Grant, your success is not a surprise. It's well earned and deserved. We have full confidence in you and we are looking forward to watching your bright future unfold. Love, Mom and Dad. Joe, you've demonstrated tremendous perseverance throughout your life. We wish you the best of luck at UMBC and with your studies of mechanical engineering. Katie, I will always cherish our years of friendship. We've become a part of each other's families and I'm looking forward to my new bedroom in South Carolina. Love, Gina. Congratulations to our peach, Maggie Smith, for graduating from Northeast High School. She will be furthering her education this fall at Millersville. Remember, her name was McGill. Congratulations, buddy. Your outstanding personality and positive attitude will take you far in life. Best of luck at Cecil, Neil. Russell, you demonstrate amazing heart and grit. We wish you the best of luck at Suzo College as you pursue paralegal studies. Kevin Urich is a candidate for state's attorney. I ask your help protecting the elderly. Too often seniors suffer physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial exploitation, abandonment, and neglect. When elected state's attorney, I will advocate for the elderly. I will bring together police, social workers, nurses, doctors, and others dedicated to protecting and caring for the elderly. I am Kevin Urich, and I approved this message. Paid for by friends of Kevin Urich, Vicki Richards, Treasurer. Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm the Reader Services Librarian at the Cecil County Public Library System. And currently, I am rereading Charlotte's Web by E.B. White, a children's book about an unlikely friendship between a pig and a spider on a farm. And I think this is probably one of my favorite children's books because I think it's one of the books that really propelled me into reading as a child. And it really made me just love reading. And so I always have fond memories um, and I love to reread it every few years. And luckily enough, it's on uh, PBS's list of 100 most loved books, which is a part of their Great American Read series. Now, they had a, a two-hour kickoff special on May 22nd, which if you missed, you can go back and watch online. Um, but basically, they've, they've chosen 100 books that they think are um, 
culturally in, important or influential or just beloved by, by the American public. And over the summer, you'll have the opportunity to vote. And the list is very diverse, and I think there's something for everyone. There's Charlotte's Web, there's Gone Girl, there's um, Crime and Punishment, um, there's The Color Purple. It, it really runs the gamut of, of, of literature in America. And so you can vote online or by texting. Um, and then in the fall, they're going to have um, five one-hour episodes, each episode kind of revolving, revolving around a specific theme. And then they'll have a live um, finale where they announce the Great American Read, and that'll be sometime in October. And if you're interested and you want to learn more about it, or you, know, you want to talk about the list and, and you want to meet other people um, who are want to talk about the list, you should come to the next Library After Hours, which will be held here at the Elkton Central Library on June 22nd at 6.30 p.m. It's on a Friday evening, so after the library closes, we open it back up and you're able to come in and browse the stacks and learn about new books. Um, there's also going to be a representative from Maryland Public Television who will talk about the PBS special. And you'll also get the opportunity to vote for your favorite one. Um, and so again, that's June 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And if you're interested in registering, you can call your local branch or register online at cecil.ebranch.info. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun, so I hope to see you there. And also, if you're going to be around this weekend, on Saturday, June 9th, there's the Children's Book Festival at the Northeast Community Park from 10 to 2 p.m. And I'll be there, so if you wanna talk about books or summer reading or, or anything, I'll be there, so you can find me by the bookmobile. So, hope to see you then. On a recent Saturday, Democratic candidates for the 1st District Congressional seat met in a forum sponsored by the Cecil County Democrats. As the candidates responded to questions, those in attendance heard differing views on subjects ranging from the environment to our country's role as the world's policeman. Regarding one issue, however, their position is decidedly unanimous. When asked about whether they will support the winner of the six-way race, it appears that all candidates have committed to supporting whoever is the winner in order to defeat Republican incumbent Andy Harris. This is the kind of energy that we have to bring to the table this time around. And it's gonna, it may take five of us working together on behalf of one to pull this off. But that's what we promise to each other, is we have a lot of respect on this table for each other. And you'll probably hear it through our voices is we're not very antagonistic to each other's positions. We have different takes on who's stronger in one area or another, but collectively, we are going after Andy Harris. We need your help to share with friends. We need you to share with your acquaintances who you know probably will put Andy as their person and see if we can't get them to sway to say, he's just tragic. And we need to have change. And if they can't appreciate that, then they're going to vote Andy. But if they can really look at the heart of where America's problems are now, then they can probably see through one of us a better answer. As to what strategy the winning Democratic candidate in this race will use to overcome the incumbent, Alison Galbraith offered this. So the biggest thing that we need to do first, as a first step, is to raise awareness of the things that Andy Harris is actually doing and the things that he said. Because anybody who's had a conversation with the man wants to run against him. <laughs> We need to get the disenfranchised voters. There are people who, in this district in particular, are extremely anti-establishment. I have active Trump supporters donating and backing my campaign. And it's not that they think I'm a, a bigot, or it's not that they think that I agree with them on every little thing. It's that I took the time to talk to them, and I showed up, and I said, even if I disagree with you, I'm going to listen to you, and I care, and I'm going to show up. And I showed up in places that candidates don't show up, and I had conversations that most candidates don't have. With the primary election just two weeks away, all candidates will be making their final push to reach voters. For these candidates, their task does not end until November.